because if we're all ego constructs, it's hard when I talk about, oh, the ego, people nod their head, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, but they really don't get it. And I've worked with people who said, oh, I've been in therapy for 10 years or I've been in therapy for five years and I'm still messed up. And I thought, wow, what if I break the ego down into these eight categories? Hey guys, I'm Ashley Dawn Rivard and you are now into the Dawn, a provocative podcast that looks at all things taboo, such as suicide, grief, sex, addictions, and more. Each week I talk with experts who successfully investigate their areas of interest. And if you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe. As a TV host, author, business and life coach, and documentary filmmaker, Lisa Haysha has had one burning desire, and that is to figure out what makes people tick and why. She's traveled to more than over 60 countries in search of this. Today, we discuss how her repressed upbringing fueled her fire to break through any limitations and find out who she is as an independent, empowered, conscious woman. So I just want to dive straight in to this whole concept of soul blazing. That is your brand, I know. What is soul blazing to you? Soul blazing to me is bringing out someone's soul. I believe we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And I think when you get caught too much in the human experience, you're in your head too much and you miss the ride. So I try to help people get back to their soul's calling and live their life through their soul of what they want to do and get rid of fear, guilt, shame, and everything else that holds us back. Mm. Yeah. And you do that through coaching, right? And in your speaking conferences. And when you say that you connect somebody, I also read on you, you have an imposter model, yes. correct? Yes. Is that how to connect to one's soul? Yeah. The imposter model came up after working with over a hundred people. And I was trying to say, what are the commonalities? Mm -hmm. And I started writing down, oh, this person uses sex to get what they want. Oh, this person's just a major asshole. They're a narcissist. This person's a victim. Everything. Oh, this person did this to me. This person did that. Here's another person who sits around all day in Starbucks and is complaining about people who have made it, who don't have talent. Well, you know, so I just started putting these together and thinking, oh, wow, there's all these different archetypes. And then I kind of ran out after eight, they started overlapping and I didn't find any more as I was going along. So I said, oh, here's a good subset of characters people Mm -hmm. play to either get ahead or to fail because they're afraid of getting ahead. So what is holding them back? What is their, you know, DNA? What is going on, you know, through ancestral stuff Mm -hmm. that's really holding people back? Because why are they doing this? They want this career so badly or this relationship, but they're not getting it. They, I keep saying, oh, it was working until this. And it's something they did. And sometimes they don't even see it that way. They frame it as a victim. So anyway, I started putting that together and I found it very effective because if we're all ego constructs, it's hard when I talk about, oh, the ego, people nod their head, uh-huh, uh-huh, but they really don't get it. And I've worked with people who said, oh, I've been in therapy for 10 years or I've been in therapy for five years and I'm still messed up. And I thought, wow, what if I break the ego down into these eight categories? So once I started speaking about that and explaining the different imposters and I'm like, who's this? Who's that? You know, listing them, people would raise their hand. People would be coming up to me saying, oh, my God, you helped me so much. I get I'm a sex goddess because they could deal with one chunk. They mm-hmm. can't deal with the whole. Mm-hmm. So it's just like anything, one step at a time instead mm-hmm. of, oh, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a producer, I'm going to direct. And then it's like, ah, and you do nothing. Right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. Like, it's overwhelming. Like, Breaking oh, if you're going to be down. a writer, director, producer, There's write steps. your script first. Yeah. Write one page a day, yeah. you know, and then maybe yeah. after a couple of weeks, two pages a day and get up to five pages a day, yeah. you know, and give yourself that time. So it's the same thing with the imposter model. It's like, which one do you relate to the most? Which one is driving you? Okay. And then fix that issue. And then you will say, oh, another one popped up and another one because most people have at least two or three. So how do you fix that? Or what are some tools that one can start using when they go, oh, this is what I am? Then what? It's great to have, okay, I'm aware of it. But then there has to be something that takes place, right? To correct it. So is it just becoming self-aware and and that's a start or what are some steps? Well, that is a start. I look at the imposters kind of like a pit bull. 
And if you train a pit bull, it could be a loving, sweet pet. And if you don't, it could be a vicious animal that goes out and bites others and bites you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've heard a hundred stories about that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, my sister was just attacked by two pit bulls oh that just God. jumped the fence and she was walking her golden retriever on the street and one went after the retriever and one went after her and for 10 minutes oh, chomping at the bit. Is she okay? She is okay now, but they both had to go to the hospital oh and the dog was kind of messed up of and course. had to stay there for a week and... Then the owner said, I don't know what happened. The door just was unlocked. It's like, ah, you don't keep your door unlocked. That's just not oh. okay. I think they had a sitter that day and wasn't as you know, oh, vigilant. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, oh, they trained them to be attack dogs if someone breaks in their house. Yeah. So that's the same as your imposters. If you don't recognize them or understand how you're living your life, they're going to just take over. Then they're going to attack people in your life, friends, family, relationships, and then mm -hmm. you're you're going to be constantly saying, oh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. or sorry, I got so drunk and I said this and that, or sorry, I wasn't there when I said I would, sorry, your whole thing is sorry, or I didn't do anything. Why are you so, you know, getting so upset about nothing? And this is just who I am. And, you know, yeah. so I say you have to train your imposter. So, and I say, name your imposter, because once like you that. name it, then it becomes a character because we are all characters in yeah. this game of life yeah. and you get to write, direct and produce you. Yeah. So, oh, wow, that character is inside me that I had no idea. Like what's a character? What could you Your name sex it? goddess okay. or your whatever, Marilyn, you know, if you, okay. that relates to you or your narcissist, you know. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to say any names for you. There's some of our sisters that we all know that are famous and, yeah. you know, or the clown. You know, I've worked with a lot of, you know, comedy writers and mm -hmm. comics because, you know, my husband was in television mm -hmm. and Two and a Half Men and mm -hmm. Big Bang where it's all comedy. And I'd be in the writer's room where I talk to these writers and they're all ha ha ha, joke, 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 laugh, laugh. Once they're off, Arr. most of them, I'd say 90% are depressed. Absolutely. And they're just, you know, they have all these character um, I'm not going to say defects or flaws because that's what makes them great, but they have these character um, that they play outside of being creative of, oh, I'm depressed, life sucks, and um, life is hard, or things don't work out for me, or low self-esteem, or self-sabotage, like all these things mm -hmm. that self-loathing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, all these super successful people that are super funny you know, and are great and are changing the world, helping America laugh. And it's like, it was very fascinating to me. And they're all great people. Mm -hmm. You know, when you meet them, you mm -hmm. love them all. They're wonderful people, but to themselves, mm -hmm. they beat themselves up all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, that's so interesting. If they just knew that that was their wounded inner child and if they named it and what started it, what was the moment where you felt I'm a wounded inner child or I'm not loved or I'm not good enough because there's mm -hmm. always a starting point. If you don't know, go into hypnosis, go into meditation and really focus on it. Ask that question, sit in silence and it might take mm -hmm. you a month, you know, mm -hmm. a year, a day, a mm -hmm. minute. You don't know, depending mm -hmm. on how open you are and you'll find it going, oh my God, I remember I was in second grade and my mom washed my hair and said, why are you like me? Stop being like me. And she's scrubbing my head hard because she didn't love herself. And she's like, oh, I'm just like her. I'm sensitive. I'm a little more shy. And, you know, so she's like, no, you got to be outgoing. You got to be a strong woman in this world. You've got to be this one. I'm like, sorry, sorry for yeah. being me. And at that yeah. moment, oh, who I am is not good enough. Right. And my dad would say, don't laugh. Don't smile just so much. Don't show your gums. Sit with your legs crossed. Don't I draw or paint. Don't do that. That's for kids. Don't be immature. Just be social. Wear your makeup. Look pretty and, mm -hmm. you know, serve. Mm -hmm. Serve the man. This is who you're going to marry. You're mm -hmm. going to have kids. And if you're not married by 25, your shelf life is done. And mm. it's like, oh, my God, I've got to just be pretty and nice to get the best husband I can to serve him the rest of my life and have babies. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's your choice. Right. You know, you're going, oh, I want to create a family and the greatest family and I want to have kids. Great. It's your choice, but not this is who you were born to be mm -hmm. and you don't have options. Yeah. So once you get aware of, oh, I think that's when it started. And then I started seeing signs. And then sometimes when you don't know any better because you're a kid, you start building a case against it because you start not liking yourself. Oh, there's another way. I'm not good enough. Oh, there's another way. There's another way. Right. You know, I remember my mom did yoga for all the neighborhood kids after school every day. You know, she was a wonderful mom in that way and um, always had food for everybody, like 10 kids, because mm -hmm. our house was kind of the hub. And I couldn't do some of the moves. I couldn't do like a back bend that had the big arch where a lot of other kids could do that were double jointed. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ah, another 
proof. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's always Mm -hmm. something. And then as you get older, it builds and it builds and it builds and you get more shy, more insecure and sometimes crippling where if someone said hello to me, I'd turn red and I'd almost start to cry and try to hide. And this is like at 10, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. I didn't know that about you because you seem so you know, on purpose, we'll call it that. Mm-hmm. Like you are focused and you're self-aware and you're deliberate. And when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And so I was thinking, um, which I wanted to ask you, did you ever have any of these emotions or thoughts, guilt, shame, self-doubt that held you back from creating this life that you live, which is a very empowered woman who, you know, does what she wants to do with love. Mm. Um, I've had all of those (laughs) guilt, uh, shame. Yes, absolutely. Um, And it still lives with me all the time. I think we all do. And I think it's a part of the human condition. And I almost feel if you don't have it, you're not living life fully, or you can't dig deeper into your soul's purpose without it. And I think everything that happens to you is somewhat um, predestined for who you're supposed to be. And you could either see it and accept it and take ownership of it. Like, thanks, mom, for doing that. That made me think Mm -hmm. and, you know, pushed a button in me to go, "Eh, eh, I'm on alert. Mm -hmm. Something's something's different with me. Then when you're different, maybe you could go out in the world and do something different because you don't care anymore. You're already screwed up. You're already (laughs) not lovable. You're not liked. You're not good enough. You're always behind. So it's like, I have nothing to lose. If you are always the best, then I don't want to try anything because I've got this image. I'm the best. I don't want to try and fail. So you really created, I mean, from what I hear you saying of like how your father said, be this, do this. This is what women look like. This is, you know, to be, you know, acceptable. This is what you need. You need to be married. You need to have kids. And you went the opposite. You traveled. You created a life, you know, that wasn't that. Was it hard then to break away from that programming of your parents or were you just really focused on like your you were in touch enough with your soul's calling? No, I was fucked up. <laughs> my, okay. my, my dad pulled a gun on me when I was 16 for baking a cake three houses down and it was five o'clock and the street lights were on and I was walking home in my checkered schoolgirl uniform. And he never was home. He worked 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. He got home. So he happened to be home that day because he was starting to work a little less when I was in high school. And what are you doing? He pulled a gun because I was at home. As soon as I walked in the door, there it was. And I'm like, what's going on? I was just baking a cake for my friend at school the next day. Mom knew. And what are you, a whore? And what are you doing walking around the streets like that? I'm like, it's my school uniform. (laughs) I'm not walking down the streets like a whore. You know, just like this much from your your hemline to your knee is showing and knee socks and wallabies and, you know. So at that moment, but I understood him. It was Iraqi way. And I have four other sisters and he didn't want one to get um, you know, in trouble where it would mess up everyone else if one, you know, strayed mm. the whole reputation of the sisters and the cousins and the second cousins and the third mm. cousins and the whole community would, oh my God, did you hear about then everyone's reputation is ruined. So I got and I knew he did it out of love, you know, because that's mm-hmm. just, I experienced a lot of intense discipline in our culture, Mm, but it still didn't feel good. And my mom was going, stop that and tried to take the gun. Oh, you got to send her to an orphanage and get on the phone right now. I'm like, what is an orphanage? That is fascinating. An orphanage. And, you know, I was 15 or 16. So then I said, oh, I want to run away. If I had the money, I would. So he gave me a wad of money. I'm like, great, I'm leaving. Then he's like, why should I give you money and took it away? And I went to my room crying and I just sat there and thought, wow, He's protecting me from everyone outside. I'm not ever allowed to go out, talk to strangers, go camping, have sleepovers because everyone might hurt me or be bad. So maybe the devil's within. And that's what broke me. I said, I don't, I come in alone, go out alone. I'm alone. 
And I, at that point, started hitchhiking and getting cars only with like Hells Angels types. If it was a nice person, I'd say, I'm just kidding. I went to the worst of the worst, you know, ratty cars, tatted up people, you know. And I'd say, are you going to rape me? Are you going to hurt me? Who are you? Why do you drive this car? Why don't you have money? Why do you have tattoos? Why are you screwed up? Why are you an alcoholic? Have you killed people? Have you done this? Just curious, voracious curiosity, because he said, all these people are bad. So I'm like, are they? And a friend of mine at school was hitchhiking all the time. And I was saying, I'm not hitchhiking with you. And then once that happened, I said, hey, hook me up. How do you do it? So I went with her a couple of times and started doing it independently anytime Mm -hmm. I could. Yeah, just to have the experience. And Mm -hmm. nobody hurt me. Everyone was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I went, huh, the world out there is not so evil. But that set the intention in my mind I've got to move. Wow. So when, what age were you then when you really took on this work um, and developed your business? The soul placing yes. works? I think I started off as an actress and then I realized I couldn't do it because I still had too much Middle Easternness in me mm-hmm. where I couldn't do a love scene. I couldn't do, I was in a soap opera. I couldn't do the love scene in bed, even though I had my clothes on. I'm like, ah, yeah, <laughs> I'll go yeah, home. Yeah. Yeah. deep. Yeah. So I'm like, I can't do it every part. I have to say no to or do it, then quit and mm-hmm. cause a scene. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, this isn't right for me. Then what am I going to do? Who am I? And then someone said, oh, you're a writer. I'm like, I'm not a writer. Yes, you are because you tell all these stories and you have all this you know, insight. Mm-hmm. You need to travel and write. Mm-hmm. And so I started doing that. I went on a trip with him to um, Brando's Island and got a mm-hmm. book, How to Write a Screenplay in 21 Days. Sat there for 21 days and wrote the screenplay, came back and sold it for 75 grand <laughs> within a couple of months. Oh my God, yeah. that's amazing. And it wasn't great, but it was the passion in it that they bought yeah. and my my ability to sell because I was so, oh my God, the script, it's so amazing and you know whatever. So Orion took it, but then they folded. So I said, oh shoot, I have to become a producer. That's how you own your own stuff. Mm. Then I got asked to model in Tokyo. I said, yes, because they had all the money. So while I was there, I said, I got to raise a million dollars. So I do the fashion shows and do this or that. But anytime everyone would go out, I would say I'm not going because I wanted to um, raise a million dollars. So, you know, I made a joke and said, I'm not going out. And and they're such great photographers. I didn't want to stay out till one in the morning getting drunk when you're up at 5 a.m. taking pictures. So I was like, uh, I'm not going out unless someone gives me $50,000 to talk about my movie idea just to make something extreme that would never happen. So I wouldn't have to go out. But then I became the girl that, won't go out unless she gets $50,000 to talk about her idea. And it started intriguing people and they had a lot of money. So someone said, I'll pay you. No. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. So I went out and talked about once the, once the check was cashed, I went out and started talking about my script. And then he came and said, let's talk again. I said another 50000 No. Because I didn't believe that he would do it. And it's just a joke to me because I didn't ever think I'd get it, which that taught me confidence. When you stay right. firm and confident, people love confidence. Yeah. And now in retrospect, at the time, I thought I was just being a silly girl, just, aha, you know, yeah. goofing around. But you didn't have any, it sounded like you didn't have any self-doubt thoughts going on because I didn't think it was real so it wasn't real to me it was just a game so they said where's your script I said it's here you know what's it about oh I don't I can't tell you because it's such a great idea no they gave you money based on that yes so then he said okay let me take you to the board of directors of this um, machinery equipment ball bearing stuff robotic equipment there are several of the guys that tell me why and I said I'm not selling you um, a screenplay I am selling you an adventure of your life. You're all boring. You're all ha- you're robots. You have this awful life. You don't love your wives because all yeah. of them, you know, I talked to the women and the men. All of them are just like, I keep my man away. Just bring me the money. And most of the men were just workaholics and they go to hostess clubs at night and everything's on credit cards. Everything's a company card. They can't even buy a Porsche or a BMW. They have to all drive Toyotas. Everyone has to be equal. So I'm like, you can't even spend your money. And it was an enormous amount. What I recall is 90% taxes, like ridiculous amount. So all the money you make, you can't even keep. And everything's the company card. So I said, use company money, put a million dollars into this project, and you get to come to the United States at least like three months throughout the year, you know, two weeks, three Mm -hmm, weeks, mm -hmm. a month. And Mm -hmm. you get to be with all these blonde actresses Mm because they were obsessed with blondes and everyone's going to say you're investors and Mm -hmm. treat you like kings. And you're going to get this experience to tell your Mm -hmm. grandchildren and to share stories for the rest of your life. And that's what happened? 
And they said, wow. So I was selling them on that. They go, well, what's the screenplay? I go, Psycho Sushi, just because I thought they were all crazy and they all eat sushi. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> What's it about? Uh, Tokyo, because I was in LA, because I'm in LA, and uh, uh, hot sex, and because they're into sex, and yeah. cold fish, because everything yeah. is cold. <laughs> oh. They're like, oh, I like that. I said, yeah, it's really good, huh? And then they said, okay. And I'm like, okay, the money has to be in my account within a month because a lot of people <gasps> want to invest in this. It's really a great oh, idea. Oh my God. The money was there. I like, am in awe right now. I'm like crazy. No, but what that taught me is when you're fearless, people right. want to jump on board. Now, if I had a script and here's the budget, they said, how do you know it's a million? Can I have a breakdown? I go, it's always a million. I said, nobody's honest. Everyone just fudges that and gives it to you <laughs> because they have to, because that's what right. you ask for. I said, but it's all bullshit. I said, but if you look at almost all of them are a million, if you look yeah. at you yeah. know, the Writers Guild, go yeah. to the Writers Guild Independent. It's a million. That's what it is right now. And we'll make it fit in the million mm -hmm, dollar mm -hmm. bracket, mm -hmm. which we did. And- you know, so I said, it doesn't matter where the numbers fall. Just trust me and let's have an adventure of a lifetime. And this is what you're going to remember for the rest of your life. Not that you showed up at your office every single day, day in and day out for 40 years. Right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love that story. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. amazing. So something else I, I love about you um, when we met is you were telling me about your marriage. Yes. And it was so unique to me. You were the first woman where I felt oh, maybe I'm not so out there because of the, the what is the word I'm looking for? Like how we're taught in society that relationships and marriages look like, right? And how uh, I know I have always thought, oh God, I'm so independent. And how how do I get in a relationship if, you know, because it's like I'm battling myself and I'm battling with my family and society and, and all that. So when I met you and you were like, I'm married and we've we don't live together. We live in separate houses. And I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> now, I don't know if it was amazing for you, but I thought it was amazing that you chose to do something. And it, it seemed like you had no shame in it, you know, where a lot of women try to make their marriage look really perfect right mm -hmm. and you weren't you were like this is what i this is the way i think it is. each marriage is perfect for how you want to make it you create your marriage i don't believe there's any one way i think the reason a lot of people are unhappy because they go oh this is the way it has to be or this mm -hmm. is what my parents were like and this is what you know my friend's marriage is like i think we're all such unique beings and all have unique needs mm -hmm. and um Unless you consciously create your marriage, which is what my husband and I did, we said, this works for us. Um, he was married before and he mm. had kids. And it was the idea that, oh, the youngest one wasn't going to get to live with him by himself for a year. And then we got a house and we said, oh, let's all move in there. And then the house seemed too small for everybody and because we weren't... Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. just fell in love with the backyard. Oh, okay. <laughs> Walked in, wow. And yeah, then we yeah. thought, oh, wait, the rooms are really small yeah. in here and this and yeah. that. Going, I don't know if that'll work. And a friend of mine came over. I said, help us make this work. He's an architect. And he said, this is your soul blazing sanctuary. It's not a house. This uh -huh. is like a cabin house. He said, you'll never make it work. It's impossible, especially huh. blending families and no space and offices are in living yeah. rooms yeah. and all that stuff. So I went to Lee and I said, this is what my friend said. And he said, oh, wow. I said, come look at it. And I said, maybe this is my workspace. And this, and then, you know, because I was doing workshops and retreats. And I said, maybe we stay living together or maybe I live here. And then he said, would you be okay living by yourself? I said, are you kidding me? Yes, I've been single my whole life. I mean, right. I was getting married at 43. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, um, no, I'm going to just do this. And um, he said, great. And I said, this is awesome. So I created the house and then we had sleepovers, of course, uh -huh. and we saw each other when we wanted to and we uh -huh. set um, date nights and we yeah. set sleepovers and it was great. Yeah. And then when his um, son went off to college, we're like, how's it working for you? He's like, do you want me to move in or do you want to get in? I'm like, you know, I'm good. And mm -hmm. then he's like, I'm good. And I'm like, really? And we're both going, OK, let's just check in each year and see mm -hmm. where we land. Mm. Then we had Ava and... It, I don't know. I think it worked for him not being mm -hmm. there a hundred percent and mm -hmm. whatever. It worked for me because you don't fight about how to raise a kid because mm -hmm. everyone has different ways of raising a right, child. Right. So 
Yeah, it just worked. It just wow. worked for us. And we checked in each year. And if we wanted to see each other more, we just crash at each other's house for a week or two. And then, okay, wow. we're good. And then, yeah. and we took a six week vacation every year. Oh, wow. Like to Cambodia or someplace big, Cuba, something. Yeah. So we had a great chunk of time. Yeah. That was just us or us and Ava. When we had Ava, and I always yeah. brought a friend to help. So, yeah. you know, we could have fun too. And Ava could have a good time and where we'd still get a little privacy. And right. so it worked. It was awesome. great. Yeah. There's this, um, I saw an interview with an intimacy coach and she said, if you want to make your marriage work, this is her opinion. If you want to make your marriage work, have separate houses. Yeah. And it keeps a mystery there. That's what she's you know? saying. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Have you heard of the psychologist? Is she a therapist or psychologist? Esther Perel? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was like reading her work and, yeah. you know, amazing. just the whole yeah eroticism mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. her whole work is on eroticism or i yeah, don't know but yeah and i watched her together oh okay <laughs> different times, okay yeah. um yeah so i want to kind of shift gears and, and we'll we'll touch base then more on well your... let me just oh. share one last thing on yeah. that when she said that's the way to make marriage work i don't necessarily think that's the way to make make marriage work i think um everyone's unique. Sometimes uh -huh. people like to be with each other all the right. time because we're all wired differently. But I think it works for some people. And I think people should go, who am I? And be honest about it. Because if you're a person who needs more space and you're with a person who needs to be attached to someone 24 seven, that will be disastrous yeah. and the same opposite. Right. So I think you got to be honest in the beginning and not yeah. just say, I just want to get married. So I'm going to stuff who I really right. am. So I'm likable or lovable, yeah. then let it slowly creep up when the marriage starts, yeah. you know, after year one yeah. or whatever. So I'm just being honest with yeah. who you are and kind of what we did. Let's check in with each other. We both needed space at that time, but we both wanted someone who had our back. Right. So we're like, okay, how are you doing? Checking in. And if one of us said the opposite, we'd say, okay, let's regroup or let's split, you know, whatever. Yeah. We would figure yeah. it out. Yeah. But we checked in and we're both like, this is awesome. Yeah. We both felt yeah. it was in sync, but not to do it to someone. I'm going to abandon you emotionally and not live yeah. with you. Yeah. You know, because that's who I am. Once you said I do, it's like, wait, my Absolutely. deal was getting married. Yeah. So yeah. it's a very fine line. So for me, it's about being honest nice. with who you are before saying I do saying this is who I am. Like before I got married, I said I traveled two or three months alone every year. Right. You have to be okay with that because that will not be stopping yeah. once we're married. Yeah. He said, oh my God, you're my dream girl. Okay. And I'm like, oh yeah. really? He's like, yes, you promise you'll keep doing that because he gets bored easily. And he oh. worked every single, you know, Monday through Friday, long yeah. hours, a lot of pressure. Sometimes he just liked to not even have a conversation over the weekend or when he comes home. So he's like, mm -hmm. oh my God, that would work great for me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, okay. That's a match. And did you always feel connected then? Yes, very much so. Even if you didn't speak to him for a day, a few days? Oh no, or we week? would connect oh, always, just through- okay a phone call or something. Okay. But what I'm saying is like having to entertain someone for the evening or, oh, right. let me sit down and crash right. and talk for two hours about my day. And yeah. Absolutely. So all that kind of stuff yeah. was just a check in. Oh, I'm in yeah. Cape Town shark diving. Yeah. Wish you were here. I'll take pictures and send you uh -huh. this and that. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. I'm in Tokyo at a tech shop. Do you want to come? Here are some of the things I think you might like. I'm going to buy you this. What else do you want? Talk to the guy in the store. Oh, what do you have the latest? Because uh -huh. like, to, then I'll bring them home. Good. So it's like a, yeah, yeah, I opened yeah. the eyes for him when he had to work. I got yeah. to be his, you know, travel that. the world for him. Yeah. So he got to live vicariously because he didn't like to travel that much that yeah. far away. So mm -hmm. it was, yeah, so it has, you have to just be authentically you is my thing. I wrote an mm -hmm. article about this and people like, oh, ah, you have to live together. You have to do this. You have to do that. And I'm like, no, you misunderstood me. It's, you have to be honest in your relationship, not have affairs. I don't believe in mm -hmm. all that stuff. You have to say, this is who I am. And, mm -hmm. you know, really mm -hmm. make those decisions together yeah. and whatever it is, it is. And if it works for you, do it. You know, yeah. I don't think there's one way. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. So good for women to hear because with everything with women becoming more independent and wanting to be more entrepreneurial and then this pressure of having kids and there's just this old paradigm of how society and the world has worked is shifting, right? And Absolutely. So there's this pressure and this resistance where we're like, oh, I'm here. No. Oh, crap. Like, you know. And so many men now want to be parents more hands on yeah. and got to share that responsibility and let both work and both share yeah. raising a child so the child doesn't say, oh, I never got to know my daddy worked yeah. all the time. I mean, I yeah. think it's beautiful. So yeah. you got to like yeah. figure out who you are, then find that match and not I love that. Yeah. Be dishonest from the beginning. Yeah. Yes. So now you have decided to separate. Yes. Right. And you're going through, I believe, what you call conscious uncoupling. Mm -hmm. What, what does that look like? It's saying what, 
who we are today. We've grown in different directions. Mm-hmm. Um, when he was working all the time, it worked, but now mm-hmm. he's retired and he's like, oh, I don't really like traveling and I don't really like social mm-hmm. situations and I don't really like, you know, I want to go mm-hmm. move to a, mm-hmm. you know, a smaller town mm-hmm. or be away, you know, an mm-hmm. area without so many people or hustle mm-hmm. and bustle where I'm going, oh, I love traveling. You knew that right. about me from day one. And yeah. I love creating intimate dinners and yeah. social events and bringing people together. And he knew that. So it's like, wait, but he's like, oh, now that I'm out of that, this is what I want. So we're like, you know what, let's honor that. Mm-hmm. And let's see what we can do. So for about two years, we have been going, okay, what do you want to do? What do I want to do? And trying to make it work. And we go, wow, we're just kind of compromising for each other. Mm. And we both understand we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And we're here to grow and learn and evolve. Our souls are supposed Mm. to evolve. We don't want to be trapped in our humanness Mm -hmm. of this is what we did. We said, we're going to get married and everyone's watching us because we said we're doing it our way and living separately. You know, we get a lot of media calling. Are you still together? Are you still together? So yeah. it's like, oh, we got to stay together because to that's prove. what we said. Yeah. And it's like, no, you don't. This is part of the journey. Yeah. And so we're saying we still love each other. It's yeah. just, you know, our humanness, our human yeah. characters want to have a different experience. Yeah, I want to keep traveling and yeah. learning and growing. And he's yeah. like, I'm done. I just okay. want to chill, watch TV, hang out, take walks, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you be you, boo. And yeah. <laughs> I'll be yeah. me. Yeah. No oh. judgment. So it's like, okay, so now how do we, you know, yeah. deconstruct our marriage? So conscious uncoupling is a way to do it gracefully and through communication and through love instead mm. of, I hate you. You destroyed right. my life and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You have to do this because yeah. we're married and you said this. And it's like, yeah. Every day is a new day. Yeah. Every day you grow. Every day you learn. So whatever, you, whoever you said and were 15, 18 years ago when we met, it's like we've grown so much since then. So why you have to stay the same? No, just right. because someone said, oh, this is what I want. At yeah. that time it worked. Now I think both of us would like to live with a partner and be have a more deeper, intimate relationship, you know, for, you know, act three of our lives or whatever. Mm-hmm. And together, it's kind of impossible because we're such opposites Mm. where before we loved it. I loved having Mm. a responsible guy who worked all day and took care of, you know, hell the floor while I was off going, woo, (laughs) experimenting and learning and growing. And he loved that I was off because he didn't want someone 24-7 with him. Yeah. So it was a perfect marriage. We supported each other's needs and we came together. We had a great time and had a lot to share and a lot of laughs and okay, let's separate again and come back. But connecting each day, of course. And yeah, so it worked. But now it's like, wait, if we're both kind of home all the time, and we want different things, like I love music all day, and he likes TV. And Mm -hmm. I mean, just little things, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. he made a joke about even temperature, you know, I like 68, 69 degrees in the house, he likes 74, 75, (laughs) 76. He's like, I'm always cold in your house. Like, I'm always boiling. Oh my god! It's like everything is different. I love a glass of wine. And you know, I'm a vegetarian, he's a meat eater and doesn't drink, you know, it's like everything is opposite. So Wow. I think it's great that you could be that conscious to to go through such, you know, a very sensitive um, situation and and also having such a strong vision pulling you on this is what I am creating and there is more. Yeah, but we're saying let's stay close friends. Let's stay family. We're soul family. Let's raise Ava with peace and love and, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit shifting now into I know you have a documentary coming out, right? And it's a 90 day transformational journey that you, that you have gone on and you're going on still share with me a little bit about like, how did you come up with this idea? And then what does it look like through this process and how have you transformed? Well, what came up for me to even do this was I decided to separate. (laughs) Mm. So it was the catalyst. Yeah. And my life was so bombarded with so many responsibilities because I love filling my plate with fun stuff and social stuff. And I looked at my calendar and going, oh my God, I've got this, I've got that. And with Ava's schedule, I've got this little party for her, this slumber party, this cook chef coming over, this event, that event. I'm like, wow, wow. I'm looking at the next couple of months. And it was like, I had no me time. I was just so busy Mm -hmm. doing and trying Mm -hmm. to be the greatest mom and be the greatest wife and be a friend to 30 of my closest friends. (laughs) Looking at my phone every day, there's 30 text messages and phone calls. And I'm like, you know what? I need a time out because if I'm going to do this separation, I need to be conscious and know who I am and how I feel and not um, 
completely bury all emotions through events and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I said, I need to clear my calendar. So I said, I need 90 days to sit in silence and just be. So I, you know, told all my friends, sorry for 90 days and family. I'm kind of out. I'm not going to be going to your events. I'm not going to have events. I don't want to hang out. No coffees, no dinners. Just I need to be alone and go through what I'm going through right now. So once I said that, friends understood. Where before I'm like, oh, I need a time. Oh, come on, just come. I'm like, oh, okay, eventually. <laughs> so once I put those parameters, for some reason, people respected that a lot mm -hmm. more because it was like, mm -hmm. this is serious. I mm -hmm. need this mm -hmm. for my mm -hmm. health and mm -hmm. well-being. But little did I know that I would bring in thought leaders and healers and all these beautiful people. But now my schedule is still, still really booked up. <laughs> a friend calls, yeah. I'm like, sorry, I can't get back to you until next Thursday. <laughs> yeah. I'm so busy or I'll try to call you. I don't know. Yeah. But um, so I've had a few events where I can invite some friends to and go, hey, and catch yeah, up a little yeah. bit. But it's been intense. Yeah. I think I've had, you know, five healers come over a week and then thought leaders and wow. therapists. And I mean, all this kind of stuff, I feel so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that everyone does something different. So yeah. It's been wonderful to get a taste of what all these amazing people are doing around town and learning a lot. But I think after this 90 days, I need 90 days to, to, decompress, <laughs> to, to decompress, like go away to a different country. And yeah, just or just chill. Phone. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's going to be, you know, yeah. definitely 120 days because I at least need a month to even yeah. finish up the editing and just kind of chill. Yeah. And then maybe two more of just yeah. digesting and integrating everything I learned. You know, the only thing is really still being a mom. Right. pretty much full time, but the, everything else needs to still be on hold to a certain degree, go out a little bit, but keep it low key. Mm -hmm. So what is the most meaningful shift you've had thus far through this experience? Getting the importance of silence and decluttering your life mm. and really going through everything and saying, do I really like this or is this a habit? Mm -hmm. And getting help in the areas that you need help in instead of trying to do everything on your own. Like I say, oh, I need to do everything because I know how I need it done and I know this. I have one assistant, but works like four hours a week. Mm -hmm. I've got to do everything, but then things start piling up and go, you know, I really don't like admin. I really don't like, you know, paperwork. I really, mm -hmm. but I can do it. No, I yeah. even hate filing to put a receipt in a receipt. Things like, <laughs> oh, that's so much work because <laughs> it's so boring. I don't want to spend right. a second of my life being yeah. that bored. And I know it sounds yeah. silly, but it's like, it adds up because you're doing so many things and it's like, what is this writing on it? This was for this yeah. this was for that because you have to yeah. you know absolutely categorize everything and it's just it ends up being a lot and you're going how much time in your life do you do something you don't like and maybe there's a friend who you could bargain with you know this person does massage this person mm -hmm. does admin you know an accountant switch and do each other favors then you get friend time and you get your needs met so i realized just really paring down your life to its simplest form where you're still happy but um yeah getting everything still done. Yeah. I love that. I can't wait to see this because I know, mm. you know, we've been talking through this journey and you're doing mind, body and spirit. Mind, body, know? heart, soul. Heart, soul. Yes. Okay. Covering all areas. Yes. Right. Yes. So you're really like, really flowering into like a whole new woman. I feel that. And I think creating your mornings is really important because mm -hmm. that sets off your whole day. It mm -hmm. sets your mood up. It sets it, the grounding, your intentions. Mm -hmm. And I think even if you do that for five minutes, it's really important. If you could do it for longer, that's great. So meditating? And meditating, even if it's for two minutes of visualizing mm -hmm. how you want to see mm -hmm. your day mm -hmm. and writing down, you know, this is what my day is. This is the important things because I realize um, before doing this, even though I got this because I've been mm -hmm. a coach forever, but mm -hmm. Um, it really hits home again yeah. when you go, what is important to me? Because yeah. we all love to procrastinate right. because life gets hard. You go, you know what? I just feel like sitting on the couch all day watching TV right. or just doing nothing, reading a book, yeah. you know, and yeah, and you just never have time for that. Yeah. And I just want to do that today. So then sometimes you do that, then you're going, okay, now I'm so yeah. backed up. Now yeah. you got to yeah. just get out of bed and yeah. do, 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 do. And it's like, oh, what's the most yeah. important thing? Because yeah. then you'll say, oh, let me go get a cup of coffee. Let me go. Right sit outside for a minute. Let me return this, this phone call to this friend's really important. And this friend's really, you know, instead of kind of doing, okay, let me get the hard stuff done by noon and then yeah. do whatever it is you want to do. Okay. I like yeah. that. Yeah. So I ask um, everyone a few um, specific questions on what does connection mean to you? What does that look like? How do we create that? 
connection to me is feeling a deep intimacy with whatever it is you're doing for starting with yourself. Because if you don't connect to you, you don't connect to anything. So really focusing on how can I connect to me? What are my thoughts and what are someone else's thoughts that they put inside my head? Mm -hmm. And that's really hard. That could take a year to do. And if you do a little bit every day and just say, again, journaling and saying, who am I today? What are my thoughts? And just, I call it a mind dump, writing everything down and then going, oh, what's mine and what's not? Why did I have that thought? Or what, where did that belief come from? Because I don't really believe that, but that's, yeah. I'm living my life. Oh, I have to be this way because you're conditioned to, but wait, that's not really me, you know, yeah. then start working on those and creating a self-forgiveness around it and then creating a new reality around who you really are. And then saying that forgiveness every day until you've mastered self-forgiveness and then creating that new intention, who mm-hmm. is the true you. Mm-hmm. That's okay. really important. So then once you could do that and connect to you, so I would just focus on that first, then you could start connecting to people authentically and maybe release friends or people in your life that don't you really don't want to connect to, but you didn't know that until you connected to yourself because mm-hmm. you're wasting a lot of time on people who really don't care about you and people who you really don't connect with. You're not on the same way, wavelength anyway, mm-hmm. but oh, I've known them forever or oh, they're so nice. Nice is nice. You could be their friend, but not a uh, inner circle friend because mm. we only have so much time and you need yeah. to be around people who inspire you, help bring out the best version of yourself yeah. and you doing that to them. And that's a true friendship and a true connection. Mm. Yeah. So mm. where does vulnerability show up in your life? Everywhere and everything. Okay. Because if you're not vulnerable, you're not being real. If you're not real, you don't really have a life. You have a fake life. So you have to just put yourself out there and say, this is who I am. This is how I feel. That's why even on camera, when I woke up, I have no makeup on. I have nothing because this is who I am. Judge me if you want (laughs) from the video. That's the biggest uh, thing I got. Everyone's saying, um, how could you do that? Oh my God, I can't believe you're on there without makeup. It's like, wow. (laughs) Wow. And most of these are women. Yeah. And it's like, are we really that backwards that, you know, uh, a friend of mine's daughter, Stephanie Hardison said a quote of, since when do we have to pay rent? Um, you we have to be beautiful, like it's rent every day. Mm. You can't just be you. It's like, nope, if you're a woman, you got to pay your rent. Your rent is being beautiful. Yeah. Put on your makeup yeah. and show up, yeah. you know, all dolled up yeah. because that's what women do. It's like, no, you we get to be us too and leave the house without makeup, just hair in a ponytail and mm-hmm. your ratty jeans and then the cozy sweatshirt and absolutely go. Yeah. That's sometimes when you feel your most sexy. You do. you're really connected to just, this is how I feel today. Yes. And owning that. Yes. And, and owning your you. weight. You yeah. know, everyone, not everyone, a lot of people fluctuate in weight, Yes, you know, 20, 30 pounds up or low and yeah. everyone's got embrace it and not judge yourself yeah. at that. You know, I remember yeah. I went swimming and I was a little heavier and how can you go swimming like that? There's no men and women here. You know, oh I'm like, God. it's my house, my pool. Someone said that to you? Not once, several times. <gasps> yeah. Just because, you know. Oh my, well, that's their own projection. Yeah. Because they couldn't do it. Correct. Yeah. But it's just like, oh, you can't do that. You you know. But look, still you to have a say it. Oh my God. Because they're closer friends or whatever. So <laughs> it's like, don't do that. So-and-so is going to be here, this person, you know? Wow. You know, just dip yeah. your toes in or your legs in. And I'm like, no, I'm going swimming. Good for you. I don't care. Good. But it's because if you don't, that's what is vulnerability, yeah. what you were saying, because it's like, if you don't love yourself every stage, because we're yeah. all a masterpiece in the making. Yeah. And you, if you don't love the creative stages of, oh, okay, now I messed up or let me yeah. hear some blue, here's some green. Yeah. Oh, it has to be perfect. And the yeah. lines, yeah. then- what kind of life is that? Then you're always still judging yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. And Mm -hmm. I'm a fraud. And I'm all this Mm -hmm. because you've never like revealed yourself. Once you say, I don't care, this is who I am. Everything changed. And I do that in this too. I'm in a bathing suit, not at my best. (laughs) But it's like, this is who I am right now. So who cares? And if you don't like it, then don't be in my circle of friends. That's okay. If you want to hate on me, spend your life hating. You know, that's not who I am. Yeah. Yeah. What would you tell your 20-year-old self that you know today? Age is a number. <laughs> Age is a number. Don't put pressure on yourself. By 22, yeah. I have to accomplish this. By 25, if I don't do this, I'm screwed. Yeah. By 30, if I don't do this, oh my God, kill myself. Yeah. You know, So it doesn't matter what age you are. 
enjoy your life and everything's supposed to manifest for you when it manifests. Yes. And if you stay conscious and on track and do the work that I'm saying here of really creating your mornings, meditating, figuring out who you are and connecting to you first, then you'll find the connections of people. Once I connected to me, mm. everyone, it didn't, I didn't have to go look, people just come to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, I want to interview you or, oh, I want you to do this. Mm -hmm. Or I want you It's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because people could sense the connection to you. So then they believe in you mm -hmm. of, oh, you'll do a good job or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to work with you. So don't go and bombard people. Please help me. You're here. Can you help mm -hmm. me? I'm just starting out. Be someone who self starts and does it yourself where someone comes to you and says, I want to help you and lift you up because what you're doing is incredible. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's so important. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and and talking with me today and sharing about your soul blazing and just your authenticity of, you know, your relationship and your process and how you became to who you are. Mm. Um, it's it's really it's beautiful. Oh. So thank you so much. Oh, and I can't welcome. wait to see your documentary. Oh, thank you. You're in it. <laughs> you're a BFF. I love you and adore you. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's so great. So it's inspiring. Hmm. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, honey. That's it for today's podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. Please let me know what you think. Leave a comment, share. And we'll be back next week with a new episode. 